Next speaker will be Monica Moreno Rocha, and she will talk about the connectivity and unboundedness of two components for elliptic functions. Whenever you want. Thank you, David. And, and uh, as always, think, I really like to thank the organizers. It's always nice to have these opportunities, although we are in different countries, and <clears throat> um, that we, we can get together and, and, and talk about our. Of, or work and uh, and it's, I have been really enjoying the uh, the talks that I have been able to to watch live. Um, you know, there's a few hours difference between Mexico and and uh, and Barcelona, so so I do apologize for those that I haven't seen in the morning. Um, all right, so let me start with um, this talk is kind of like a mesh between two two uh, recent results that I have been working with. Um, so I, I decided to title the talk uh, Connectivity and Unboundedness because essentially uh, what I have been working is um, on Hermann Rings and most of you may have already heard that talk in a different conference or, or, or seminar. And I've also been working most recently on unbounded FATU components for elliptic functions. So I was thinking of uh, talking about those two results and, and, uh, and that's why the title is a little bit uh, longer than I wanted to, to, to be. By the way, for those of you that haven't been in, in Mexico, in particular in Guanajuato, where I'm, I work, uh, what you see here is, is uh, our uh, institute. Um, and I hope sooner than later, you, you will be able to travel again, and you always have an open invitation to, to visit us in, in here. All right, so uh, let's start by giving you uh, an overview of the dynamics of elliptic functions. I, I know that most of you know uh, quite well the transcendental dynamics, uh, but probably not many of you have worked with elliptic functions. So I will try to just give you an overview, not only of uh, the dynamics, but also uh, what we type of uh, properties that we're, we're gonna be using for to, start the, to study the, the dynamics. And then eventually we'll, I'll talk about connectivity and, and unbounded fat two components. So, and, and let me start by pretty much the end. Uh, I do want to make uh, uh, a reference to three works that are uh, have been um, produced by Jim Hawkins of uh, the University of North Carolina and Lorelei Coase at Dickinson College. They pretty much provide the basis of the study of uh, the dynamics of elliptic functions. There are other works that obviously immediately uh, um, um, are related to transcendental meromorphic functions, but this is pretty much the, the beginning of the dynamics of elliptic functions. So you will be seeing throughout my talk the names of Hawkins and Kaus being uh, referenced to, because these three works pretty much uh, gave the basis of of what I'll be uh, talking about. And you also have these works by Janina Kotus and Mario Subransky. Uh, if you like uh, to see dynamics of elliptic functions for a more uh, measured theoretic point of view, this is pretty much a great, great reference. It's, I, I believe, uh, 700 pages. And, uh, and it, it has a, a large uh, chapter on, on elliptic functions. So here's another reference. Any of you that may be interested on, on working on this on this particular class of, of functions. All right, so uh, let me then start with just the basics of elliptic functions, just set up uh, a notation. And we're gonna start with a definition of the lattice. You take all uh, um, linear combinations of two complex numbers, lambda one and lambda two, we call the generators of the lattice. We only ask that the quotient, the imaginary part of the quotient to be different from zero. And we select it to be positive just for, to take it, uh, make a choice. And so you take all these uh, integer uh, linear combinations and that defines your group, a billion group acting on the, on the plane by translations by the elements of the lattice, right? The elements of the lattice, I will be calling them lambda uh, and I will, just save the notation lambda one and two to think about the, uh, the, um, the generators. So an elliptic function is essentially a complex uh, a function of a complex values 
meromorphic, transcendental meromorphic, and doubly periodic with respect to that lattice. So we have already uh, worked with, many of you have worked with uh, one periodic functions, the exponential and so on. So what I want to uh, show you, uh, hopefully with this talk, is that when you are dealing with doubly periodic functions, which is what I have written in here, uh, at least in terms of the generators, uh, uh, that's going to give you a, a very different type of dynamics than what you will see from any other, obviously, uh, function that is not elliptic. And, and, and I want to say there's interesting dynamics that comes from, from this double periodicity, but also there's some headaches. And with that, I mean, you need to uh, sometimes rewrite uh, theorems that are well known for transcendental metamorphic functions, just specifically for elliptic functions. You'll see a, a one or two examples in, in a minute. Uh, I do want to already point out that I will be denoting the lambda uh, orbit, or if you want the residue class of a point, essentially by the brackets and C in between brackets. And you always have the uh, natural projection that takes a point in the plane and projects it to this uh, residual class. So if you think about it, uh, you can also, you have the action, let's see if I can, you can see my, my bracket. Uh, um, you have, first of all, a function acting from the plane to the Riemann sphere, which is our doubly periodic function, but you also have the projection to, to the torus. So there is a natural map which I'm gonna denote here by uh, big F of lambda, that essentially is a map, oh, I think I may have, I just did it. This is wrong, sorry. I meant to say it. Uh, the function goes, sorry. The function goes like this, right? From the torus to the Riemann sphere, and you can use this function to uh, come up with some, uh, uh, for example, the number of ramification points that you apply the Riemann Horwitz uh, formula for this function, and then you can compute how many ramifications points you have right away, right? Just by looking at the Euler characteristic of those two Riemann surfaces. So, so if you want, you may want to consider the action from the torus, the flat torus to Riemann sphere, and you may want to consider just iterating over residue classes. You can do that. Uh, you need to use the projection map in order to define a well uh, holomorphic uh, function over residue classes, but you have to uh, avoid all those uh, residue classes that are related to the, uh, the poles of the elliptic function that you have from the plane to the Riemann sphere. So there is a way to do that from the torus, to, or let me say it from residue classes to residue classes. Uh, but usually the, the, the easiest part is to, uh, to work with the um, transcendental metamorphic function acting from the plane to the Riemann sphere. So most of the times you will see me talking about this type of, of representations of the elliptic functions. Okay. Um, all right, so we have just the basis of, of, of the dynamics and let's, let's go to something also very basic in, in uh, um, elliptic functions, which are the fundamental domains. Uh, you take a close connected set of the plane and that's gonna be a fundamental domain if, as you know, there is always, uh, for any point in the plane, there is always one representative in the, inside the fundamental domain. Uh, uh, and if you take, uh, two points in the, uh, in the interior, they cannot be related in the same residual class. So if that happens, maybe it's in the boundary, but in the interior, you cannot have, you can have only one element from the, each uh, residual class. And uh, fundamental uh, domains can be, the fundamental parallelograms, so you, we are gonna be mostly drawing uh, parallelograms. And that gives you what we are, called the shapes of the fundamental uh, domains. So it could be just the classical square, the triangular. Uh, the triangular, essentially, you have one generator and the other one is just a cubic uh, 
growth of unity of that generator, and that gives you also the uh, uh, fundamental domain. There is a rectangular, the, the two sides have the same length, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but do keep in mind that when we talk about fundamental domains, they can be the, the boundaries can be just as general as you want, as long as you have these two conditions uh, uh, satisfied, right? Uh, all right, um, and this is, I, I always love this uh, picture by, by Jones and Singerman with them, this fundamental one. All right, so uh, let's go back and, and talk about, all right, so we're talking about a transcendental meromorphic function, so we need some information, uh, and we have either poles of zeros. Uh, there is this wonderful term that tells you that a set of poles, of zeros, and their multiplicities essentially describe you uh, uniquely a, a, a elliptic function up to a multi multiplicative constant and vice versa. If you have an elliptic function, then you have a set of poles and zero that in principle will satisfy this, uh, uh, this condition. The addition of the poles times the multiplicity is, is equivalent to the addition of zeros times the multiplicity in terms of the uh, moduli the, uh, the, uh, the lattice, right? So a finite set of data determines up to a constant an elliptic function. And this is great because uh, if you want to come up with examples of elliptic functions of certain kind with certain dynamics, you only need to precise poles, zeros, multiplicities, and that gives you uh, an idea of, of or, or, or enough information to describe the the elliptic function. There's another way to represent an elliptic function, and this is by the field of elliptic functions that I, I'm writing in here. Here, R and S are rational maps, and you are making a composition with a bias stress P function. Here is also a composition with a bias stress P function, and here you have a multiplication by the derivative. So in a sense, uh, when people start, in particular, Hawking and Coase start uh, uh, studying the dynamics of the elliptic functions, if you notice in the reference, everything was related to the bias stress P function. And there was a very good uh, reason, not only because it's the best known uh, uh, elliptic function, but because you also, you can use P and this derivative to essentially describe any other elliptic function. So um, as you see, I'm fixing the lattice and then looking at all possible elliptic functions that are defined in the flat torus that determines this lattice, right? Uh, I, I will talk about how to parameterize elliptic functions in a minute. But in here, what I'm doing is just fixing the lattice, either here or here, and trying to determine a particular way to write an elliptic function either by rational maps, MP prime, or by providing a set of, of data. Okay. Very well. So um, let me continue. And let me talk about the order and the singular values of elliptic functions. Excuse me. Um, once more, I'm going to fix the lattice and select a given elliptic function on this uh, field uh, of functions. And what we say is that the order is essentially a number that is uh, always larger or equal to two by the real uh, theorem. That tells you that you can find a fundamental domain where there is no poles in the boundary. They have to be in the interior. And if you do that, then the number of poles are determined by what I call OF, the order of of that. And, and this is obviously counting multiplicity. There's another way that if you uh, look at the solutions of this equation for any, any uh, point in the sphere, in particular, A could be infinity, uh, then uh, the number of solutions up to the counting multiplicity will be also the order of the uh, elliptic function. So every time that you uh, look at the dynamics of the elliptic function acting from a fundamental domain to, to the sphere, you have a ramified branch uh, cover. And, and because of that, you won't have omitted values. And it's more or less uh, uh, easy to see that you won't also have uh, asymptotic values because of the action of 
the elliptic function of the fundamental domains. And I was, I just mentioned that if you consider, uh, if you uh, represent the elliptic function as a function that is from the torus to the Riemann sphere, then you apply the Riemann Horwitz equation and that gives you exactly that there exists two times the order uh, of the number of ramification points. Obviously, the, those are contain also poles of high multiplicity. So if you want to talk about critical points, you have to just take them up, out. And that is it's an easy uh, uh, computation. So you end up with exactly the order plus this number that I call RF. That is just the number of poles in a given fundamental domain without counting multiplicity. So the Weierstrass P function, uh, you are probably familiar with that. The, the, the critical points of P in a given lattice are, are given by the uh, half points of the lattice. So remember that I call lambda one to be one of the uh, uh, generators, lambda two is the other one. And lambda three is usually we say it's, this is the sum of lambda one and lambda two. So essentially you have, this is a collection of critical points of the elliptic function. The critical, uh, so you have three critical points uh, because the order of the bias stress is, is, is two. And I know that it's a single pole the middle represented by C, which is zero. And obviously every element in the lattice is a, is a pole. So there's a double pole. So I only need to add two plus one like, to, to know how many critical points I have. All right, so the main, the importance here is that you end up that there is no metered values, no asymptotic values. So the singular values of uh, any elliptic function is essentially bounded by the number of uh, critical points that the Riemann Horwitz formula uh, gives you, with this uh, uh, obviously taking out poles of higher order. So we are talking about uh, 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 functions of finite type, and uh, we know exactly what the dynamic, the, the Patu components will will look like, right? Um, okay, so then let's move to the uh, the dynamics of elliptic functions. Just all these. Uh, uh, results in meromorphic functions or finite type uh, are essentially give you that there is no wandering domains, there is no Baker domains. So you end up with only super attractive parabolic and rotation domains. Uh, that could be uh, the classification of periodic Fatu components, right? And, uh, and also uh, Hawking and Coase proof that you should expect that, that the Julia set and the Fatu set are invariant under translations of the lattice. So uh, whenever you draw uh, the Julia the Fatou set of, of a given elliptic function, you have this repetition of components uh, through, the, through the lattice. Um, and just for kicks, let me just define the Julia set as the closure of the uh, pre-images of the pole is essential singularity and infinity and, and the Fatou set just as the complement. But, the other definitions with everybody knows is are the same. And I should mention that whenever you, we're talking about transcendental neuromorphic functions, we know that uh, the Fatou component can be empty. And that happens also in the case of elliptic functions. The Julia set could be the whole uh, Riemann sphere. Um, you can also have one invariant component. And in general, for transcendental meromorphic functions, you may also have two completely invariant components or infinitely many invariant components. But because of the lambda invariance of the Fatou set, uh, you can easily rule out the existence of two completely invariant components, right? If you have, I don't know if you can see my hands, but if you have two completely invariant components, just a translation, the action of the, of the, uh, of the lattice will tell you that eventually you can intersect this one. Uh, by some translation, and that's, that's impossible, right? So every time that you look at components of the Fatou set, it's either empty, it has one invariant component, completely invariant component, or infinitely many invariant. And that's, right, that's, that's the whole uh, possibility here. All right, so uh, let's see. Uh, I think this is my final uh, 
a slide in terms of uh, an introductory uh, part of, of elliptic functions. So throughout this talk, I will always fix a lattice and consider the dynamics of a elliptic function, always a non-constant elliptic function. So I will be working with this uh, field of elliptic functions that I mentioned before, this combination of rational maps composed with via stress, P prime, so on, so on, right? So um, uh, if you want to talk about parameter plane, because uh, what I'll be saying is that I fix a, a lattice and then there's one function that I'm looking at, but you obviously want to talk about conjugacy classes, uh, perturbations, so on and so forth. So one easy way to do that is once you select the function f lambda in this field, but you just add a constant and use that constant as a parameter. And that gives you a, a parameter plane in right? a one dimension, complex dimensional parameter plane. That's, and, and, and if you see, these functions will also be uh, inside the same, uh, the same field. So you are fixing the torus where you're looking at all the elliptic functions. And if you add a constant, you're still in the same torus, right? There is another way uh, to parameterize the dynamics of the elliptic functions. And here, here's one example. You take the lattice, you multiply by a non-zero constant, and you just vary the constant uh, in the plane. And it, this is surprising because most of the times where you think, it, okay, I have the torus. If I multiply by, an, uh, let's say, a positive constant, the only thing that I'm doing is, is either uh, expanded the torus or making it a little bit tiny, but you know, the, the uh, what I want to say, uh, the uh, the generators are, are have this exactly the same, uh, the fundamental domain, the fundamental parallelogram defines the same, has the same moduli, complex moduli, right? And just expanded uh, by a constant, but, but the dynamics is different. Once you select two different values of k, the dynamics of the functions will be, if k is sufficiently uh, different, k1 and k2, then the functions will also be sufficiently different. And that uh, property comes from the homogeneity properties of the Weierstrass free function and the derivative. Let me don't, not get into that, but there is some identities that tells you how the Weierstrass free function acts when you multiply the lattice by a constant. So there is another way to do parameterizations. And the other one that I, I find also fascinating is that if you take a lattice and there is G2 and G3 invariants, I won't go too much into discussion of that, but essentially there is two complex numbers that satisfy the discriminant uh, uh, property. You want this condition to be non-zero. And if that happens, then you can determine a lattice and vice versa. If you have a lattice, their invariance will also satisfy the discriminant condition. So what you can do is that given a lattice and their uh, invariance, you can vary the invariance in this space, the C2 minus where the discriminant becomes zero, and that gives you another way to parameterize a uh, given function. So in here, you sort of are fixing the function and then changing the lattice. And for what I'll be working, uh, you can, fix the lattice, and then just parameterize by some constant. And, and you, this type of functions will land again in the same, in the same tops, right? In the same set of elliptic functions. All right. Um, um, I guess in, in a different talk, I'll, I'll mention what the parameter planes of this, of the functions that I'll be talking about uh, look like, but not at this time. But I do wanted to, to mention that it's possible to parameterize the dynamics of the functions and, and things are very interesting. Uh, very well, so let me now move ahead and start talking about uh, several results. Excuse me. Um, and let me talk, start with uh, the connectivity of factor components. As we know, uh, periodic factor components of transcendental meromorphic function may have connectivity one, two, or infinity. And for a long time, we didn't know if, in particular, connectivity two uh, was possible. So remind you that if you have a periodic factor component with connectivity two, then it has to be a, a Hermann ring. 
So um, one of the recent uh, results uh, shows that there is, uh, in this case, uh, uh, in the case of elliptic functions, there is Hermann rings. The theorem is stated as there exists an elliptic function of order at least three with a forward invariant Hermann ring. I do want to say that uh, the statement, the, the, the invariance of the Hermann ring has nothing to do with the proof. It's just that it was easier to, to write it down uh, by just looking at one forward invariant component, but it can, the same procedure uh, works for elliptic cycles of, of, of proving the existence of cycles of Hermann rings. And um, you probably know this, uh, there's several ways to construct elliptic functions. The easy one here, because you're dealing with elliptic functions that are essentially represented by series. Uh, so the best way to, to work is by just quasi-conformal surgery. There's no way around to, to do that. And uh, I should mention that it's still missing uh, from the last year paper that I, I still don't know an explicit example of an elliptic function with a Hermann ring. And uh, I will tell you why in a minute, it's, it's not that easy to, to compute, but at least we know the existence. And I do want to point out that we need to have order of the elliptic function at least three. You need in each fundamental domain at least three uh, poles in order to have uh, Hermann rings. All right, uh, so that was uh, the idea. I don't have a picture of elliptic functions or, or Hermann rings, but I can show you this nice picture, and probably this is the nicest picture you're going to see in the, during the talk. This is a, a, a picture of a function that is the bias stress P function over a, a lattice, fixed lattice, close to constant. And I have selected the constant and also the lattice, which is what I, we call triangular. And you probably can see, let me use the uh, the pencil to draw the boundary of the lattice. Right here is, is the origin. And you essentially have lambda 1, lambda 2, and the addition of lambda 1 and lambda 2, which is lambda 3. You can probably see that the, the boundary is in purple. And if you divide, uh, uh, take this angle and bisect the angle by this green line, then essentially you have two equilateral triangles, and that's where the name comes from. The shape of the of the uh, lattice is triangular. Uh, what you have here is at the centers of those uh, triangles, in particular, this center is a fixed point. That is a, a single fixed point. Uh, the uh, the angle is just essentially the square root of five minus one over two the golden mean. And what you see in black is the boundary of the single disk. And since p, the function is p plus p, the critical points of this function are essentially the critical points of the bias plus p functions, which are the half lattice points. So you have here, here, and here. So this is in particular an example of a fixed single disk with three critical points in the boundary. And uh, these yellow tiny hairs are just numerics. Don't, don't pay too much attention to that. Uh, this is then invariant. This single disk there is invariant. What you see here, here, and here is just pre-images of the fixed single disk. And the tiny little ones are just second, third pre-images and so on. So, so near the pole, you see so this a, a, a bunch of pre-images converging into, into the pole, right? Which I, I like it quite a lot because when, when you try to explain to students what a, a, a essential singularity will look like near that, then you can look at just a, a neighborhood of a pole for an elliptic function. That gives you a very good idea of how integrate the, 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 all the pre-images are uh, Ne, uh, getting closer and closer into the uh, in this case in this case the pole, but also in the central singularity. All right, so um, so the idea is that if we have if we could start with this function and do 
a surgery to produce a Herman ring, then uh, what happens is that whatever you cut off and throw away uh, some part of this disc and then turn it into a single disc, you also, let me make this a little bit bigger, you're also adding at least a pole. So what you look around in here, this type of neighborhood of a pole, you also should be in the interior where it will be the, the new uh, Herman ring. So if you want to picture, use your imagination and picture what a Herman ring for an elliptic function would look like, just think about making a hole in here and then translating this type of picture which is near a pole also inside that. And, and, and possibly many other things uh, will be happening in the interior component of the uh, Herman ring. Okay, so, um, just a quick overview of the construction. You're, most of you are familiar with uh, uh, quasi conformance surgery. So you start with two functions and the lift function of some given order, let's say two, and a rational function of degree at least two with invariant single disk. You uh, set up the angles of the rotation angles, so on and so forth. You, if you want, you can want to put the centers at the origin, et cetera. You produce uh, the surgery uh, and then you get a quasi regular function that since you are doing all the surgery in a neighborhood here and then repeating by uh, the dynamics, you're not doing surgery near uh, the poles, right? So essentially your quasi regular function happens to be again, doubly periodic with respect of the same lattice you're adding poles, so then you have not only the same number of poles that you started with, but you also add d minus one uh, poles. They were zeros of the elliptic function, oh, sorry, of the uh, rational map that now have turned into poles. And as always, you have an uh, annular domain that happens to be g invariant under that, and that's what you eventually want to turn into a Herman ring, right? Um, so then uh, you get a Beltrami differential, uh, well-defined, bounded dilation, invariant, G invariant. And not surprising, the Beltrami differential is also going to satisfy a condition of uh, the action of the lattice on, on, on points will be just invariant under that. Right? So then the theorem essentially tells you once you uh, obtain a quasi-conformal map that integrates that particular Beltrami differential, you do the compositions and you get a doubly periodic uh, metamorphic function. But now it's periodic with respect of this lattice, because now the quasi conformal map is acting on the whole plane, not, not locally as we did uh, at the beginning. You keep the same order. So uh, we say that this was at least two, D was also at least two, so at least you have an order three elliptic function. And there's this invariant Hermann ring, which is the image of the annular domain that we obtained before, right? So as you can see, um, at the beginning, we are not changing the lattice when we look at the quasi regular function, but it's right at the very end that we do have a perturbation. So we sort of lose some information. I don't know exactly what is the generators of this lattice anymore. I, I know the order and the multiplicity of poles and zeros, but I no longer know exactly what are the values, right? And if you recall, I need that data to, in order to produce a, an information. So I have an idea, approximation, how this uh, uh, quasi-conformal map is, is perturbing things, but still, this is essentially the reason why it's not been easy to find an explicit uh, uh, description of, of, of the function. Okay, so I, I think that's all that I want to say about the construction of existence. Let me, um, excuse me, what, how, how am I doing with time? I got a little bit lost. Yeah, you still have a lot of time now. So it's supposed to finish at 20 past, I think. Okay, okay, so I'm, I'm doing fine, okay. There's not too many slides. So, so, so let, let me just now mention quickly these results. Uh, if 
it was known that over any lattice, the Weierstrass P function had no cycles of Hermann rings. And that's why the idea that there were no Hermann rings in the, in the class of elliptic functions came up. But uh, then we have the existence. And uh, if you remember, the Weierstrass P function is an order to elliptic function. So it happens that in, in analogy to Shishikura's result for quadratic rational maps, we have this, I, I like this term quite a lot. Uh, if you have an elliptic function of order two, you cannot have Hermann rings. So to the minimum order, there is no Hermann rings. You need at least three years up to, to produce a Hermann rings. And um, well, there is just a quickly description of the proof. If you have a double pole, the same ideas that Hawkins and Coase use for the Weierstrass P function it comes through. But otherwise, if you have simple poles, two simple poles on, on the fundamental domain, think about the Jacobi elliptic function, then you have to do a, a different approach. And, and actually, once the paper was published, I should confess, I realized that the proof of this theorem was far easier than I what is published. So uh, it's another. Uh, argument that quasi conformance surgery will give you this 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 result. So the, if the uh, referee referees are in the audience, sorry about that. That's an easier proof <laughs> that can be done. All right, let me move ahead and uh, just mention other two consequences of quasi conformance surgery in, in now in in, in for elliptic functions. Uh, we have this result that uh, if you have a metamorphic function from the plane to the Riemann sphere with a finite number of poles then that number, n minus one in particular, is, gives you the number of invariant Hermann rings. Uh, so there is this analogous result to the, this, this uh, theorem. For elliptic functions, you have at most the order minus two forward invariant Hermann rings, okay? O minus two, so it's a little bit different. And, and I was telling you, there is some results you already know for transcendental metamorphic functions, but the condition that you need finite number of poles doesn't hold for elliptic functions because of the periodicity. But if you look in the fundamental domain, you have a finite number of poles, and then you just need to figure out how to use similar results that you know for transcendental maps in general, transcendental metamorphic maps uh, with finite number of poles. Sometimes they extend to, to elliptic functions if, if you just consider the action on the, on the fundamental. And finally, uh, there is another result of, of when you cannot have Hermann rings. And, and if you have a elliptic function with a unique pole in the fundamental domain of maximal multiplicity, there is no way you could construct a Hermann ring or a cycle of Hermann rings in that. And again, that's essentially quasi conformance surgery uh, uh, arguments. OK, so that's the case for. Connectivity two, let me just quickly move into connectivity one or infinity that uh, for periodic uh, components. And uh, I, I, as we know, uh, uh, this, this first uh, result is well known uh, and it happens, it's also true for elliptic functions. If you have that each two component has at most one critical value, then you know that all the two components are simply connected. Right? So this is the relation between connectivity and critical values. Uh, there is also this uh, result by Hawking and Coase that if you have a hyperbolic uh, elliptic function, and I have the definition here, let me just move on, but it's just a standard uh, enough expansion of the derivative in, of the n iterate and, and Julia and points of the Julia set there are no poles, uh, pre-poles in, uh, in fact. So if, if your function is hyperbolic, and you have one component that contains all the critical values, then the Julia set reduces to a Cantor set. There is enough contraction to see that every component of the Julia set will be uh, a singleton. And you will be infinite, uh, have infinite connectivity, right? So whenever you have a two component with more than one critical value, and you want to decide the connectivity of that, you need to use symmetries or either the symmetries of the function or the symmetries of the lattice and so on. So it's a case by case uh, uh, study to, to determine the connectivity of the component. 
that has more than one critical value. Uh, so I won't go further into that because as I say, it's, it's a sort of a case by case. Um, but I do want to point out that because of the lambda invariance of, of the double periodicity of the liquid functions, there is a beautiful connection between having one component with more than one critical point and unbounded fat two components. So let me use that to move ahead and then get to the next part of the talk, the final part of the talk. That will be unbounded components, okay? So now I want to use this relation between critical values and un unbounded components. Excuse me. All right, so let me uh, immediately move ahead and then what is an unbounded component? How I already mentioned there is no Baker domain, so you rule those out. There is no wandering domain, so that's fine. Uh, so an unbounded component in terms of the elliptic functions, the definition is, it's, it looks silly, but it's, yeah, it's what it is. Uh, it's a, a two component that is not containing the fundamental domain. It, so if, if, if that component overflows the fundamental domain, then by the periodicity it has to be unbounded. Right? That's more or less uh, easy to see. So we do have examples of unbounded components whenever you have a forward invariant basin, or if you want the pre-image of a forward invariant basin for attracting, super attracting and parabolic cycles. And the alters are just the permutation of the alters you have seen it through this talk. And uh, we've recently, uh, Jane Hawkins and I were able to come up uh, with an explicit example where you have a parabolic cycle, you have a a fixed point, which is parabolic, and has uh, two uh, parabolic basins. One is bounded and the other one is unbounded. Uh, I don't know if I have the picture here, but uh, it happens. Right? And, and in terms of rotation domains, uh, I just recently heard from Hawkins of Coast that they now have an explicit example of a fixed single disk, so forward invariant single disk, that one of the pre-images is unbound. So I haven't seen the details, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure they, uh, it makes sense. The, the idea certainly makes sense that, that this is zero are possible. Obviously what is missing here, we don't know if we have a Hermann ring, a pre-image may, we could build it in such a way that the pre-image is, is unbound, right? Okay, so that's for unbounded. I will go back to this and be more precise about the definition of the classification of unbounded two components. So let me talk just briefly about bounded components. And this is also uh, quite straightforward. Every periodic rotation domain has to be bound. Why? Because if it's not, if you have, let's say, some fundamental domain, and let's say there is a single disk that overflows that fundamental domain, then because of the lambda periodicity, there will be a point here, C, and another point from his uh, residual class that will be mapped by the function to the same point, right? Because of the lambda periodicity. So that will violate injectivity on any rotation domain. And, and the proof, the first proof was for single disk by Hawking and Coase, but the same, essentially the same proof uh, holds for permanence, right? So rotation domains will always be bounded. The pre-images could be, could be uh, unbound. All right, so let me go back to uh, unbounded. And uh, there is this definition that classifies, sort of classifies unbounded fat two components. So, single total balance or what I also call double total balance. So let me uh, use the pencil to describe this definition. You take a FATU component, any FATU component, doesn't have to be forward invariant, just a FATU component. And we're gonna say that that is a single total band. If whenever you see the projection of you, let me, let me draw the, uh, the turtles, right? So somewhere I have the projection. Whenever I see the projection of that component into the torus, uh, it is a topological band that contains a curve, a non-trivial curve in terms of the homotopy, right? So uh, uh, let me, what I'm saying is that you have 
some component, if I should draw it like this, this would be uh, the image of, of you under the projection. And, and there is one curve that is non-trivial in terms of the, uh, of the torus. So if you look at this component and you pull it back into the plane, what you will see, let's say, is I have the lattice, uh, well, the fundamental domains defined by the lattice, and in particular, I'll have one component where this red curve that is non-trivial, homotopically non-trivial, maps into some curve. I'm, I'm just drawing it to be parallel to the, uh, uh, to the lattice, but it doesn't have to be like that. It's just easier. And then there will be some component, some FAT2 component that will have to contain that, that right? So this will be U. This will be the projection, sorry, projection of you into the torus. And that is a way to be unbounded. So there is one direction from where you're, you're gonna be unbounded. It doesn't have to be parallel to the, uh, uh, the boundaries of the fundamental parallelograms at all. But the idea is that there's one direction where you, you go ahead into towards infinity. So those are single toral bands because there is one direction where you go out. And then there is the double torque bands. And this is a little bit easier to define. It's just to see it on the plane. There is this FAT2 component that contains the boundary of the fundamental domain. So there is something, there is some boundary in here that is every element, there is a, a epsilon neighborhood of that fundamental domain contained in, in, in the component U. And as you can see, if I have that by the lambda periodicity so also you contains this boundary and the other boundaries also. So you, you sort of like extend towards infinity in two directions, right? There will be, if you want, if, if you're thinking about the red curve that I mentioned before for the single turtle band, you will also have some red curve in here and also a red curve, but actually you have infinitely many directions where you're extending towards, towards infinity, right? So um, double torque bands are, uh, will give you disconnected Julia sets uh, because essentially what happens is that if, again, if you have a component that contains an epsilon neighborhood of the fundamental domain, I know everything that I just shade is FAT2, points in the FAT2 set that belongs to you. So I know there is at least one pole in the interior in the complement of this shaded region and I know the poles and infinity are two points of the Julia set, so I'm disconnected the Julia set. Uh, this condition of being disconnected is either can become Cantor or just be disconnected without being, being Cantor. Right? And I think I have this uh, note that uh, there is an explicit example of a, a, um, elliptic function of order four where you have a double total band uh, that produces a disconnected but not counter Julia set. I think I'll show you in a minute uh, a picture of that. Okay, so unbounded components will be classified as single or double total bands. And I think I'm getting close to, to uh, closing the, the talk. So let me just quickly give you a couple of examples of total bands and mention the result that I, I, I wanted to also uh, show you in with respect to unbounded total bands. So here is what you see in white is uh, a component that contains these curves that project into the torus and they're homotopically non-trivial. In black, you see a FAT2, FAT2 set that I think there is a two periodic cycle in here and everything in between, uh, what is not white, what is, uh, he, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, uh, there is a fixed point in here so this uh, band, this single toral band has a fixed point. And these are just translations of, of this invariant, forward invariant uh, component. And then you also have some other uh, dynamics in here. In this particular vision, you can also probably see the, the line 
that maps into a homotopical non-trivial component. There is also a super attractive fixed point uh, right at the center of the, uh, of the picture. And there is something else, right, that you have. In fact, I, I think you can see the uh, fundamental domain is a rectangular. There's also here a fundamental domain that is rectangular. And uh, there's, I think, another attractive fixed point in one of these components. And uh, um, this is an interesting uh, example because uh, this is an example of a single uh, total band that is infinitely connected. I, I don't know if you can, let me see. If you can see the zoom that I just did, there is those uh, small um, islands, blue islands, they are just pre-images of these regions. And there is a pole somewhere in here that is producing this. There. So, so this is a, a single FATU component, that, a, a single total band, sorry, that has uh, infinite connectivity. And I'm not so sure if this one is also, it, it, this one I think is simple connected, but I, I completely forgot. And anyway, let me just move, move on and, and then show you double total bands. In this case, the lattice is a square lattice. The function here is one over P the Weistress P function. And you have super attractive fixed point. There is two other critical points from the lattice, the mid half points. And that point in here is, uh, is a pole, double pole. And essentially what you have is a cantor set. And here's another example where uh, here's a little bit difficult to draw the lattice, but I think it's, it must be something like, like this. I think it's a rhombic what they call rhombic lattice, that is a fixed point, super attractive. There are two other critical values in here. There has to be another critical value in this tiny uh, 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 field Julius set, and there is another one somewhere in here. That one is a, um, a different function of order four. It has eight critical values, and at least you have one, two, three critical values in one component, and you have. Uh, a double total band. So the question, and, and this is the main uh, part of, of this uh, unbounded components, uh, the, the result, sorry, the main result of that, is that you want to have a condition that determines when you have a single total band or a double total band in terms of how many critical values you have in one component. So uh, I will just very quickly tell you that this is a result only for order two elliptic functions. Uh, you fix the lattice, you take one of those functions, you assume you have a FATU component that contains, let's say, some number of critical values. If it's at least two, you can assure you have a total band that could be single or double. And if you have at least three, in case of order two, that's enough to produce a double total band. Just very briefly, since you know that it's at order two, you can write any elliptic function of order two as a Mobius transformation, uh, the vice split function precomposed by a Mobius transformation. We know how many uh, 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 critical values we have in terms of if you have a double pole or a simple pole. If you remember, I say, if you have simple poles, that's kind of like Jacobi uh, elliptic functions. And there is also, very particular condition for this type of functions, there is a critical symmetry. Any times that you have a critical point on a FATU component, if you have also this point in, 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 in the component, also the symmetric one through the critical point lies in, in there. So, uh, and I should definitely mention that uh, Hawking and Coase knew about this result number one uh, for P but now we can uh, produce the same result uh, and a little bit more if you have a negative function of order two. I have wanted to give you the description, but I don't have time, so let me move ahead. And the questions that I have in here, let me go back to, again, to the definition, to the main theorem that I have. I'm saying that if you have two, at least two critical values in one component, then you have a total band, but I'm not telling you if it's single of, of top, right? So one of the questions, and I, I really wanted to have this result before the, uh, the Congress, but I, I wasn't able to, to do it. But I claim, this is my claim, I hope, I hope it's true, it still holds, 
if you have a, a lifted function of order two with exactly two critical values, my bet is that that's going to produce only a single total bet. Um, and and then, then, that, then you have a way to just completely determine when you have single or double total bets. Uh, if you consider in higher orders, if you have an elliptic function that has order at least three, uh, I would like to just essentially try to find a, a similar result if this is true, of course, if this claim is true, I would like to know the minimum number of critical values that I need in one component. So one of the pre-images produces a single total value. I don't know if you, you see that. This has to be, if you have too many, then you're probably going to produce a double total value. So there has to be a minimal bound on, on, on the number of critical values only to produce single total values. And lastly, uh, if going back to the connection of connectivity and unbounded components, uh, we mentioned that double total bands will have, by definition, will be infinite connected. Uh, we already show you a single total band that also is infinitely connected. And the question here is that if you are in lower orders, so order two, uh, we know the single total bands exist, but my bet is that you will have simply connected single total bands as long as you, you are in a low order elliptic function. Why uh, I still I'm trying to look the, the right reason to that. I, I know that numerics experimental uh, uh, computations always seem to show single total bands that are simply connected. So there is an extra connection of connectivity, the number of critical values and poles that will tell you about uh, a relation between single total bands and, and so that's it. Thank you for your attention and and for the Barcelona. Thank you for the beautiful talk, Monica. Are there